Well, is anyone excited to be at church today? Ah, yeah. Come on. I'm so glad that you are joining us as we continue in our series, A Whole New World, a series on the book of of Joshua. And last week we dove into the story of Rahab and how to look past our past. And the first week we talked about the passing of the baton from Moses to Joshua and how Well, hey, is anyone excited to be at church today? Ah, oh, yes, yeah, so glad that you are joining us as we continue in our new series, A Whole New World. That's right, as we've been looking at the book of Joshua, and last week we learned about the story of Rahab and how to look past our past, and the first week we talked about how the baton was passed from Moses to Joshua and how we... Well, hey, is anyone excited to be at church today? This is getting a little awkward, and I hope maybe it's making you feel a little uncomfortable. Well, good, because that was the point. Because today we are talking about the idea of being forgetful and how it is important for us to remember. And I'm not talking about being forgetful like I forgot my keys or I forgot where I parked the car, I forgot where I left my kids, right? It's all the same thing. No, but I'm talking about how Dangerous it can be for us to forget what God has done. For us to forget the miracles of God throughout the ages and the scriptures that we read and forget the miracles that God has done in our lives. I want us to really grab on to this truth right here. This truth right here that forgetfulness can lead to faithlessness. I want us to get that into our brains this morning. You can just say this with me wherever you're at. Forgetfulness can lead to faithlessness. It can be one of the greatest enemies of our faith when we forget what God has done in our lives. And it can just start to weaken our faith and our relationship with him. And so today we're going to look at one of the most epic stories that we see in scripture and how this was, a, this was an event that you, you wouldn't want to forget. And God made it really clear that he wanted them to remember. And so we're going to see through this story the significance of how important it is for us to remember. And, and how that is important for our lives and how it benefits our lives when we remember. But not only our lives, but those that are around us and affected in our lives. But before we remember why it's important to remember, I want to pray for you. And pray for me. Father, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for just gathering us here today. And that we didn't forget uh, to lean into you today uh, as we just dive into your word and what you have for us. And so help us to, to grab on to something specific today, uh, to carry into this day, into this coming week. Control my mind and my speech as I communicate. Pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you have a copy of the scriptures, I want you to open it up to the book of Joshua. We're going to be in chapter 3. And this is just an amazing event because they are now, the Israelite nation is literally on the brink. They're on the edge of finally being able to cross the Jordan River and head into the long-awaited promise, the gift of the promised land. And so they're, they're ready, they're excited, and so here's where the story picks up. Joshua chapter 3, verse 3. It says, and this was very specific in how they were going to cross. It says, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, and because it normally would be carried by the Levites, but when you see the priest actually carry it, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length, which would be about a half a mile distance. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Now we have to remember, what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? We've talked about this the last few weeks. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. The Ark of the Covenant was a reminder of God's presence and how God was among his people. And the gift and the miracle of what that presence actually means. And it shows us a great example of how God's presence is important for us and how we have to have a healthy balance of when we meet with him, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant represents that he is near, that 
that he is close and that we can be real when we go to him in his presence. But it also shows us here this symbol of, of this distance that they had to keep, showing the oddness and the magnificence and the holiness of God's presence. And so, yes, he's near and he's a comfort and he's close, but we also have to be respectful and have a reverence to get on our knees before a holy and magnificent God, maintaining that healthy balance. And so when we remember who God is, it draws us into his presence, and then it draws us to have a connection with him. Remembering what God has done, what does it do? It increases our connection with him. When we remember what God has done and the miracles that he has done, it draws us into his presence, and it increases our connection with him. And I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of that over and over and over again about what he has done and be in his presence over and over again so that that consistency and that strength of that connection continually grows. It's really interesting that in chapter 3 and 4, a fun little fact here, the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned how many times? 17 times. That's a lot of times. Why? To show us as readers, to be reminded of how important it is to have the repetition of God's presence in our lives. I need his presence spoken to me over and over again because I'm so forgetful and I'm so quick to, to, to lose my identity in Christ and try to find my identity in other things. And so I need to be reminded and reminded. And that's why the local church is so, so important. And, and I want to talk to you specifically, our online community. Uh, for those of you that are, are still, you're, you're connected here, you call this your home, and, and, and for some of you, uh, you're, you're not in person right now because you're sick or you're on vacation, or maybe you haven't been back since the pandemic started. And I just want you to know, and just hear my heart here uh, on this, is that if you have not come back in person yet because of health reasons, because of your high risk, or you have a loved one that's high risk, man, we honor that, and we understand that, and we respect that, and there's no judgment, there's no pressure whatsoever, and, and we can't wait to see you someday, we miss you, and, and we know you gotta do what you gotta do uh, until you feel like it's time to come back and stay safe and come on back. But I'm not naive enough to think that, not, that that's not the case for everyone, that, that there's some of you watching online and you have made this now become a substitute for in-person gathering and now it's, you're not here because of a habit. And, and if that's the case because it's just a habit now of not coming in person, I want to encourage you, come on home, come on back because there's nothing like being in the room. To, to, to hear God's word with other believers, to hear the singing of other believers in your ears, there's nothing like being an in-person community. And so if it's just out of habit now, I want to invite you to come on back and be in his presence in the room. Remembering God's miracles, remembering what he's done, what does it do? It draws us into his presence and it increases our connection with him. Where, where is your connection like right now with God? Do you feel close? Do you feel distance? Remembering what God has done increases our connection with him. And so now, here they are. They're right on the edge of, of, of heading into the promised land. And then he gives very specific instructions of what's going to happen, of how they're going to cross the Jordan. God told Joshua, then Joshua told the Israelites, what's going to happen is, is the priests are going to go down. And as soon as their feet touch the water, as soon as their toes dipped into the water, whew, I'm going to divide the water so that you can cross safely to the other side. And you got to imagine the priests are hearing this thinking, well, I hope Joshua's right, because if not, we're going to look like idiots if nothing happens, and we're just going up to the Jordan here and trying to get to the other side. And so here's what happens. Check this out. It says, And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the ark were dipped into the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all of its banks throughout the time of harvest. Remember that. But as soon as soon as this happens, the waters coming down from above, it said it stood up and rose up in a heap very far away. So imagine this moment. The priests literally touch the edge. The water hits their feet and whoo, 
And this massive separation. And all my life, I've always thought this separation, it was kind of like a narrow path that they would see. And you could kind of see the walls on both sides very, very close. But if you continue reading, it gets very specific that the water spreaded all the way out to the town of Adam and all the way down to the Dead Sea, which was literally, no joke, it was literally a 30-mile separation of a gap that God separated this. Which makes sense because there was a million plus people that had to cross to the other side. But imagine this. If 96 was a river and you were to take 96 in Novi all the way over to Howell, Michigan, from Novi to Howell, that's the distance that the river was literally pulled back and parted to, so that the Israelite nation could cross safely. I mean, imagine that miracle. Imagine 96 in rush hour just filled with cars and then all of a sudden, whew, it was empty, and you could just literally travel freely with no cars on there. That'd be a miracle in itself. Well, here's what happens. It keeps going. It says, and the people, the Israelite nation, passed over opposite of Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, it says that they stood firmly on what? On dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan. This was incredible. And the fact that they were literally standing on dry ground and not sinking and not sinking into the mud into the swamp into the marsh was a miracle in itself and that the people were able to pass through because remember this would have been muddy this would have been swampy this would have been very very difficult to cross but yet he made it solid and dry ground for them to walk across this was an unbelievable a miracle that like was no other and what's really interesting when you think about this, is that God waited till this time for them to cross. He could have had them cross at any other time, but he had them cross the Jordan at the worst possible, not ideal time. Because like we read earlier, this was during the harvest time, this was during springtime, and so this was during the flood time of the Jordan River, where the Jordan's current was the strongest, was the fastest, which was spread out, which created more marsh, more mud, more difficulty to cross, and God had them cross at the most difficult time. Why did he do that? Well, maybe he did that to show them to show off his power, to bring them to a very impossible point where the only way that they could ever do it was with God and so that when they would remember and look back on it, they would remember that he was the one that delivered them and that no one else could do it and that they were completely dependent upon him. Which reminds us, that remembering the miracles, remembering what God has done, what does it do? It increases our dependency on him. When, when remembering the miracles, remembering what God has done, it increases our dependency on him. Has that ever happened for you in your life? Has God ever brought you right to the point where something seems so impossible, something seemed like there's no other way, there's no way out of it, and he brought you right to that point and then showed off his power? Maybe that was some, there was a, situ, a financial situation when you're wondering, how in the world are we going to do this? And then all of a sudden, boom, his provision shows off and increases your dependency upon him. Maybe there was a relationship situation where you felt like that ugly feeling that you were feeling, that division, there was no hope for, for reconciliation, and then boom, reconciliation, increasing your dependency upon him. Maybe you had a health situation where it was not looking good and then healing fell upon you like no other, increasing your dependency upon him. Remembering what God has done increases our dependency upon him. And when we don't remember what he's done, and when we don't remember those miracles, what happens? Pride starts to rise. And we start thinking, well, I can do it. I got this. I can handle this. I can deliver us. And then we stop looking for God to show off his power. And we think, well, I guess I'll just show off what I got. But man, I don't know about you, but I'd rather see God show off than me show off because I got not a whole lot to show off for. So important, when we remember his miracles, we, when we do that, it increases our dependency upon him. 
And so there they are. The water is being held back. The, the millions of people are literally crossing the Jordan. And then here's some more detail that takes place. While this is happening, Joshua called 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed. A man from each tribe. you got the 12 tribes of Judah. So you got 12 men going out there. And here's what he says. He says, I want you to pass on before the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the Jordan. And I want you to take each of you a stone upon his shoulders according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. So there they are, thinking, okay, he wants us to do what? He wants us, yeah, he wants us to go into the Jordan, and he wants us to literally grab a stone. Yeah, like this, like right here, like this stone right here. And he wants us to literally grab this stone. Okay, we'll do whatever he says. Okay, so we got the stone, and then here's what happens. It says, I want you to use this stone specifically, because someday when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. God made it very, very clear that he wanted them to remember. They wanted him, them to look back, and he created this memorial using these 12 stones to remember showing us another great example of that when we remember what God has done, what does it do? It increases the next generation's faith in him. When we remember what God has done and we remember the miracles that he has done, it increases the next generation's faith in him, showing us and reminding us the importance of us sharing not only remembering, but sharing the miracle stories that we see in the scriptures, the God story in the scriptures, but not only that, the miracle of the God stories that God has been doing in our lives. When was the last time you have shared a miracle, a God story, in your life with someone else? Some of you older folks in this room, you have so many miracles. You have so many stories. You, you, you have so many moments, and you're not telling them. And you need to speak up and let the next generation hear how God has worked miracles in your life. You need to share those miracles. They need to be heard. And that's why it's so important that we have Kid City and why we have our Drive Student Program and why it's so important for us to get our kids to those experiences so they can hear the miracles of God's stories. And it's really important as parents, if you're a parent to have other people speaking those truths and those miracles into their lives. Because last time I checked, the older my kids get, the more that I'm not as cool to them. And so they need to hear it from other people to have other influences, influencers in their life so that they can make their faith their own faith. Because, and what happens if we don't? I mean, right now the stats are sobering of the next generation leaving the church called nons, they don't have any affiliation with faith whatsoever. And so if we don't share the stories of the miracles that God has done in our lives, what's it gonna do? It's gonna create more lostness and darkness in our world. It's so important for us to remember what God has done so that it increases the faith of the next generation in him. And so the story ends the whole nation crosses the Jordan River. And the moment that the last priest headed out of the riverbank and put his feet on the outer banks of the river, the moment his foot left, whew, the water went back to the way that it was before. And then Joshua grabbed those 12 stones, stacked them on each other, and made the memorial as a reminder to say, don't forget. Don't forget what God has done. And he continues and he closes out here. He says, don't forget, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you. For you, nation. He did it for you until you passed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is what is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. When we remember what God has done, what does it do? It increases our confidence in him. When, when we remember the miracles of what God has done, it increases our confidence in him that he can do it and that he can do it again. I mean, what did it say? It says that, remember, he, he did it in the Red Sea, so if he can do it in the Red Sea, then why can't he do it in the Jordan? 
And, and if I have a God that can part the Red Sea and can part the Jordan River, then heck, he can do whatever he can do in the big problems that I face and in the small, trivial, anxiety, doubts that I have in my life today. Remembering the miracles. What does it do? It increases our confidence and our courage and drives out anxiety and doubt in our lives. But if you're like me, a lot of times my tendency can make God small. It's so easy for me to minimize him to my level or to my limits. Don't limit God to your possibilities. Don't limit God to your possibilities. One of the miracles, one of the, the remembering tokens that God has given me lately in my life to build my confidence in him and that he's going to keep doing what he's going to do and me trusting in that is by this guy right here. Maki. Maki. Why? Because whenever I see him, and I tell this to him all the time, it reminds me that he shouldn't be here. He shouldn't be here, that it's impossible that he's here. He shouldn't be here. It's a miracle that he's here in this story. I, I don't have a lot of time here, but and I'm going to tell you this whole story someday. But here's the cliff note version. I mean, five years ago, when we started Miles City Church, I sat in an Asian parking lot in Novi, and I just felt God was speaking to me, just this idea of, you know, just help start a Japanese church here in our, in our town. And I just sat there in my car with my hands open, and I said, Father, however you want us to help, here we are, use us. And then I didn't do anything. I just prayed about it. And the year goes by after year after year and then puzzle piece starts to connect and puzzle piece after puzzle piece after puzzle piece to then me meeting Maki and God networking us together. The problem is he's got to get to America. He's got to get here. He's got to be able to get into America. We got to be able to fund him. He's got to have a place to live. How is this going to happen? And then two weeks Two weeks before the entire world shuts down because of the pandemic, we got a place for him to live. He's funded, and he's on an airplane with his family to the USA. Not possible. It's, it, it was impossible, and yet he was here. And so every time I see him, I walk into the office. And I see him, and if I'm doubting, I'm wondering what God's doing, or how are we going to do this, how are we going to do this? I see Maki, and I see that smile, and God uses Maki constantly in my life to encourage me, to give me confidence that, <laughs> don't forget, he shouldn't be here. So whenever you see Maki, you, just, you can tell him, like, you shouldn't be here. No, that wouldn't be nice, but you know what I mean? Like, but seriously, like, it's, it's unreal that he's here. And then when we think about the future of what God's going to do with this Japanese church, if we're not thinking impossible, it's an insult to God. We, 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 we have to not think in our limits or our levels. We have to think impossible, only it is possible through God's strength and what God is going to do and how he's going to part the Jordan through what's going to happen in this Japanese church. It's unbelievable what he's going to do. Remembering what God has done when we remember what he's done, what does it do? It increases our confidence in what he's going to do and what he will do again. Now, sometimes we want a miracle, and that miracle doesn't come. Or we're still waiting for the miracle to happen. And that's how some of you are feeling right now and you want a specific miracle, or you thought you would get that miracle, and it didn't happen. And that's a whole other message. But here's a truth that I want you to just grab onto today. Is that just because that miracle hasn't happened doesn't mean that he won't do other miracles in your life. 
And just because that miracle hasn't happened doesn't mean that he has not done other miracles in your life. And so in the process, what do we do? We keep remembering. We keep remembering, and as we keep remembering, what does it do? It increases our connection and our presence with him. What does it do? Let's keep going. It it not only does that, but it, it increases our dependence in him. It increases the next generation's faith in him, and it increases our confidence in him. Now, one more thing. There's another miracle that happened in the Jordan River. And it was actually bigger than the miracle that we just read about. But this miracle happened about 1,500 years or so later. Because this miracle talks about a man that stepped into the Jordan River and he was baptized by a man named John the Baptist, which was a foreshadowing of something that all of us could experience. And this man that entered into the Jordan River was a man named Jesus who was more than just a man. He was actually God in the flesh. And he came to this earth willingly to be our deliverer, to give us a way to enter into the promised land, to give us a way to enter into a whole new world. But the only way that we could enter into a whole new world is through him. Why is he our deliverer? What is he delivering us from? You see, he's delivering you and me from our sin problem that none of us can escape. We're all guilty of it. No matter if we try to think that we're not, we've all fallen short. And because we've fallen short, it separated us from him. So we've got to take care of our sin problem somehow. But we can't do it on our own. And so that's why he came to fulfill the prophecy that he would be like a stone that was rejected. And he was willing to be rejected so that we wouldn't ultimately have to be rejected. And instead of sparing his life, he willingly died for us to take care, to die for our mess, to die for our shame, to die for our sin. But it didn't stop there, it didn't stop with death. He came out of the pit of death three days later and conquered death and rose from the grave to give you life, to give me life. And so that miracle of Jesus, later he would have ultimate many titles, but one of his titles was that he was the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone that all of us can stand on and build our lives on and have our foundation on. And so the question that I have for you is when you think about the chief cornerstone of the miracle of Jesus of dying and rising again, can you look on that miracle to be a miracle that has been done in your life or not? Have you allowed Jesus to literally save you, to deliver you into the promised land, into a whole new world and save you from your separation from God? Have you identified that stone to be a miracle stone for you? And so if you haven't, man, we wanna give you that opportunity right now. And so wherever you're watching, if you just say, you know what, Travis, I am done depending on myself for my eternity. I'm done not having confidence in where my eternity lies. And I am done feeling disconnected from my creator. If that's you, the scriptures say that through faith and belief that you can be saved and you can fix that right now by believing on the name of the Lord Jesus. And so just say to him right now, just be real and just say, Father, here I am, here I am. I don't wanna be disconnected. I'm gonna put my confidence in you. I'm going to depend on you. And so I trust you, Jesus, with my life. Thank you for dying for me. 
for being rejected for me. Thank you for rising again for me. Right now, I humble myself and I receive you, Jesus, the chief cornerstone to be the king of my life. As we continue to pray, if you truly meant that, the scriptures are so clear that you will no longer perish, but now you got a whole new world, a whole new world that starts now and lasts forever, forever. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, if you made that decision today, please do not walk alone. And we want to come alongside with you and celebrate with you and answer any questions that you might have. And so you can text the word then to the number on the screen, and we can't wait to connect with you about this amazing move that you have made in your life.